Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so the title is slightly different than the one in the program. So there is a cryptography is turned to crypto land. That was exactly to make this point even more evident that we are. So, and exactly, so this is joint work with, uh, with me here, Velare and Igor Stepanovs. And yeah, so the work, as, as uh, Amit has just said, is going to be about showing relations about notions that are centered around the notion of obfuscation. And you know, when I talk about crypto land, really, so what I mean, I you know, summarizing, I really mean this, you know, the incredible uh, and exciting landscape of uh, notions that cryptographers have been considering over the last uh, few years. And you know, one of the thing about all of these notions and assumptions that we've been studying is that they are very powerful. But something we are asking ourselves, so we should be asking ourselves, is you know, how many of these assumptions or notions are really uh, true? They, they they really exist, and which ones are too good to be true, right? And you know, in a quest to like find a good map of crypto land, you know, something that we are really good in doing as cryptographers, and we are trying to do is to exactly find relations among different notions and find out what implies what and what implies implies that something else doesn't exist. And you know, we had a lot of different results already showing, on the one hand, implications of the form A implies B, so showing that if something exists, then we can get a lot of exciting things out of it. So for example, from IO or DIO and so on. But also there's a series of exciting results that, or equally exciting results that are even a little bit more intriguing that show us things of the type A implies not B. So they show that under the assumption that one of these notions exists, uh, something else that we might want to have doesn't exist. And we get an important message out of this result, which is that we have such you know, couple of notions for which we know that at most one of them can exist, okay? So it's an important message that we get out of it. Of course, we have to be very careful and see what it really says and what are the restrictions, but we get you know, an important message out of it, okay? And this work is to be seen in this context. So uh, we're gonna study such relations and you know, the common denominator of this, uh, these results of this work is uh, you know, looking at notions of security that somehow have something to do with uh, wanting to have security in, present, in presence of some auxiliary uh, random input. That. Okay. And in particular, we, I'm going to focus in this talk on two notions. Uh, the first one is auxiliary input point obfuscation, or AIPO for short. So this is a security notion for point obfuscators in the presence of auxiliary input. And I'm going to talk in particular about one result that shows that virtual gray box obfuscation and uh, AIPO are somewhat incompatible together. So only one of them can exist for some specific construction of obfuscators, and in particular, Canetti's uh, construction of a point obfuscator. And I'm also going to talk about very briefly about potential new assumption for having such constructions. And the second part of this, uh, shorter second part of this talk is going to be about the notion of UCEs or universal computational extractors. This is actually a security notion for hash functions. So it looks like a different context, but I'm going to show that it's inherently connected with uh, AIPO. And I'm also going to talk about new impossibilities in that area. Okay? Also using obfuscation. Okay. So let me start and uh, with obfuscation. I mean, we talked about it already quite a bit. So let me just briefly repeat that, you know, by an obfuscator, I really mean an algorithm, an efficient algorithm that's randomized and takes a circuit and transforms it into another circuit C prime that somehow should not leak anything about the circuit C other than its input output behavior and, and should do this by preserving functionality. So we want correctness. Uh, we want the circuit C prime to be the same as C on all inputs. And of course we want C prime not to be much larger than C. Okay? And usually this notion of not giving anything out about C other than its input output behavior has been historically first formalized via the notion of virtual black box uh, security, which I'm not gonna really formalize here. But the key point there has been that uh, already early on uh, in, in the first seminar paper of Barak et al, we learned that actually this notion is too strong and if you want to achieve a BB obfuscation for all circuits, that's impossible. And so what people have historically done, they started looking at simple classes of circuits for which we might hope to get uh, VBB obfuscation or to get strong security, okay? And the classical example, and it's kind of the simplest function from which you might expect to get something useful and at the same time get VBB security has been point functions. Okay, so a point function is really just you know, a function or respectively a circuit in this case, which has some special point, call it K star, are coded into it, and the function is only one on that particular point k star, and on any other point it's zero. Okay? And 
we had indeed feasibility results for uh, VBB secure obfuscation of such point functions, both in the standard model and in the random oracle model. And, uh, and so this is, you know, was the first positive step uh, in the area of obfuscation. But what I'm going to talk about specifically in this talk now is point obfuscation security in the context where we have some auxiliary side information on the point K star which is being obfuscated. And uh, this was considered already by uh, Golvasser and Kalai in their paper in 2005. But specifically, and they showed some issue with auxiliary input, but specifically here I want to uh, discuss a particular security notion, which is an undistinguishability based notion for uh, auxiliary input point obfuscation, uh, which is so, which is auxiliary input point obfuscation, which is our AIPO, which what it requires, it's not a simulation based notion. So what it asks for is that essentially informally, I'm going to formalize it uh, in the next couple of slides, is that if you're given the auxiliary input A, which might be correlated with some point K star, you cannot distinguish the obfuscation of the point K star from the obfuscation of the, another random point, k prime, which is independent of k star and also independent of a. Okay. So, if a is equal to k star, that's impossible, right? Right. That's an excellent point. Which so of course that's exactly what I was about to say. So this is not something that we can expect to be true for any a and any k star because, as Evgeny is saying, if a is equal k star, there's no hope to get this. Okay. So formalizing it requires a little bit more. In particular, we have to say for which distribution of a's and k stars this is possible. Okay. And so in the way that this was, uh, was done, and in particular, I have to say that you know the. I, you know, I think the notion might have appeared implicitly here and there, but the, the place I know where this has been formalized like data is a work by uh, Bitansky and Panet from TCC12 uh, that use explicitly this notion to build uh, three round zero knowledge protocols. But um, so what you need to do here is you have, uh, coming back to this, you have to formalize for which A and K stars this is, uh, this is possible at all, okay? And so in particular, what we do is we look at so what I call an auxiliary information generator, which is really just a randomized algorithm that outputs a pair, K and A. And what I want for security to be even possible in the sense that I just described is that we satisfy an unpredictability notion, meaning that for any polynomial time predictor, uh, if I am given the auxiliary input, it is hard to guess the point K that I want to obfuscate except with negligible probability. Okay. And then what AIPO calls for, it calls for indistinguishability when I sample KAs in, with, with such an unpredictable uh, auxiliary information generator. Namely, we compare an experiment where we are at such a generator X, we sample a KA, and we obfuscate the point function IK, so it's one only on K, we get the corresponding circuit, we give it to a distinguisher together with the auxiliary information, and we want to compare this with some other world where you know, we're still sampling K with our auxiliary input, but then when we are obfuscating the point function, we just obfuscate the point function for a point K prime, which is sampled uniformly and independent from K. Okay, and then we give the actual obfuscation and still the auxiliary information to the distinguisher, okay? And we say that the obfuscator is AIPO secure if no polynomial time distinguisher D can distinguish the left-hand side from the right-hand side, okay? So we don't have really many candidates for AIPO, but something which has been conjecture is that both the obfuscator by Canetti that I'm going to talk about in the next slide and the original point function obfuscator by, by, by Otec, we, from 2005, under appropriate assumption are AIPO secure, okay? And let me stress that if we kind of relax the requirement on our auxiliary information generator, then things can actually be simpler to achieve. So for example, if we actually assume that the secret point K is exponentially hard to guess given A, then we can do things, for example, by using the technique of Doris, Karai, and Lovett, and we can do that. But the, the hardness here is that we want to do things when K is really just polynomially hard to guess and not exponentially hard. Okay. And so this is pretty much uh, the state of affairs. And now I want to spend a few more words about, for my first result, about uh, on, on Kinetic's construction, okay? So, um, so Kinetic's construction is really the simplest example of, um, of a point of Fuscator. 
And uh, you know, it has been assumed to satisfy different things in different contexts and it's a different assumption. But the obfuscator by itself relies in its simplest form on a prime order group, G. And what it does is, in order to obfuscate a point function for some secret point K, what it does is it samples just a random group element. Then it just computes, uh, let's call it Y. Then it just computes Y to the K, call this Z. And then the obfuscation is an, uh, the actual obfuscation is a circuit that I call here C uh, Y Z, which simply check, given an input X and this hard coded Y Z, whether Y to the X is equal to Z. That's very simple, okay? And clearly, correctness is perfect, right? So, I mean, uh, if you have the only, the only, so if this is a prime order group, so you know, the only value that can satisfy this is k, okay? And security actually turns out to be equivalent, in a sense, to a variant of the DDH assumption, which I call AIDDH, okay? AI stands for auxiliary input, which essentially states that, you know, the DDH assumption holds even if you're given some auxiliary, so if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you have some uh, unpredictable uh, auxiliary information generator, uh, K and A, and uh, your, your, your K is gonna be your exponent, so you're given R, R to the K, and your auxiliary input, and you want this to be computationally indistinguishable from R, R prime and A, where R prime is just some other random element which is independent of R. Okay, so if you don't have the A and you choose K uniformly, this will be just equivalent to the DDH assumption, and here we just have some additional auxiliary information about that. What's the distribution of A? What's the distribution of A? So here you're just assuming that X has this property, so it could be anything here, as long as given A, it is computationally hard to predict K. Okay. Right, right. So it's a kind of a more compacted down version where you can think of this as you know, GG to the R. Okay. But the point in traditional, I mean, the key point here is not just the form, but mostly the key point is that in traditional DDH you don't have the auxiliary information about it. Okay. okay. So it's definitely a much stronger assumption. Okay. Uh, and that's the key point. Okay. So, uh, you know, so our first result is actually about this AIDDH assumption, okay? And uh, so it states that if VGB holds, and I'll tell more about a second about VGB, then the AIDDH assumption cannot hold, okay? And uh, so by VGB, I, I, I'm gonna say explicitly in a couple of slides what I need from VGB rather than giving the whole definition because it's actually simpler. But so by VGB, I really mean virtual gray box obfuscation, which was introduced and studied by Bitansky and Canetti in 2010. And uh, so for what we know for VGB now is that, I know there's, there's also recent work by Bitansky et al. showing that, you know, under appropriate assumption on multilinear maps, it will be achievable for all of NC1. And we don't know if, you know, stronger impossibility results. But here I have to stress that we only need a special case of VGB in the proof, okay, specific. Of course, if VGB for all circuits is true, then this theorem is true, but uh, you're gonna see in a second we actually need less, okay? And in particular, I have to stress that it's not really just, you know, a break of the assumption. So if you're really interested about the security of uh, Canetti's point obfuscator in the auxiliary input setting, it's also a break of the construction, but it's easier to state it for the case of uh, the assumption, okay? Okay, so, and in particular, the proof, uh, you know, the, the structure of the proof is very simple, okay? So if you want to prove this, uh, what you need to do is, you need to give some auxiliary information generator X, which, you know, for which it's easy, you know, to see to break uh, the assumption, so given the auxiliary information. But then you also want to prove, of course, that it satisfies the, con the non-triviality condition, meaning that it's, it is hard to guess K given the auxiliary information A. And so how does it work? I just want to go to the high level of you know, how to do this. So you know, the auxiliary information is really, if you think about it for a couple of minutes, it's really what you would expect it to be, okay? So a, your generator is going to output some random K, which is kind of important because you, know, you might want to debate whether you want to believe the assumption for Ks that have lower entropy or not. But so for this counterexample, the K can be really random. And the auxiliary information uh, is going to consist of the VGB obfuscation, so for now think of an obfuscation, of a circuit TK, 
uh, which has the secret value k hard-coded in it. And all it's going to do is it's going to take a pair of group elements, y and z, and then just check if y to the k is equal to z. Okay? And obviously, this is going to break our assumption because given r, z, and this auxiliary uh, information in form of this circuit, you just interpret it as a circuit, you run it on r and z, and then you check whether the circuit outputs one. And if z is actually random, you're almost never going to output one, and otherwise you always output one. So the key point is actually proving that this is unpredictable. Okay? And that's where VGB comes into play. So what we want to say now is that, let's say that we have some fixed polynomial time predictor P. What we want to do now is we want to prove that, you know, given a sample from this distribution, it must be hard to guess K given the obfuscation of the circuit TK. And so to do this, you know, let's just do the following, okay? And I just want to map it back to you know, VGB obfuscation. And so to do this, I want you to think of the following. So imagine that we have now two just sampling algorithms that are going to speed out a circuit. The first one is just going to output just the circuit TK I just described for some random K. And the other one is just uh, an algorithm that doesn't really do much. It always outputs the constant or zero circuit. Okay. And now imagine now that we look at this experiment here where, you know, we just output this circuit TK for a random K, we BGB obfuscate it, give it to some adversary A that outputs a zero and a one. And the adversary A has just this simple form, okay? It's going to just take the circuit as input. So in this particular case, the VGB obfuscation of TK. It's gonna run the predictor that we fixed for which we wanna prove that the predicting advantage is negligible. And I'll put a guess for the secret K prime and then what we're going to do is we want to check whether this guess is kind of correct or not. Uh, we don't have much we can use other than the circuit which was input to the A. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this C prime, we're going to pick some element from the group, say randomly. It doesn't really matter actually how you pick it. And we're going to just input to the circuit that we are given Y and uh, Y to the K prime, where K prime is the guess. Now, of course, if we are in this world for real, where C prime is an obfuscation of TK, the probability that this adversary outputs one, because our C prime is really TK, it is exactly the probability that our predictor is correct. Okay? But if we run the same with uh, you know, the sampler that always outputs the all zero circuits, then uh, what we get is that obviously the probability that we output one here is always zero, because there's no way you can output a one, because C prime is the constant zero circuit. Okay? And so here it's where now VGB comes into play, okay? So we want to show that this probability is close to zero. And so it's negligible. So what VGB guarantees to us is, and this is exactly what we need here, no more than this, it implies that there exists some simulator, S, which doesn't need to be, it's VGB, so it can be unbounded, which makes some polynomial number of queries to an oracle, and which satisfies a number of things, and in particular, the first thing the simulator guarantees is that if we look at this experiment we just looked before with the adversary A, and we look at the probability that the adversary A outputs one, then, and we compare this with another experiment where the simulator is going to just access as an oracle the circuit TK, which is sampled for a random K, and we compare the probabilities that the simulator and the adversary output one, then these probabilities are negligibly close. But at the same time, the simulator, also for the same adversary, also guarantees that the probabilities of outputting one are the same if we now move to the setting where we are considering the, the sampler that always outputs the all zero circuit, okay? Okay, and we know that this is, this is zero, we know that these are close, so the only question that remains to answer if you wanna prove that this probability is negligible is to answer how close these two probabilities are. But that's easy, okay, because now we're really asking to see uh, you know, what is the difference between the probability that the simulator outputs one when interacting with this circuit, uh, with the TK circuit for a hard-coded random K, or when interacting with the O0 circuit, okay? And you see that the only way to do this is that, even though the simulator is computationally unbounded, is to make a query such that the discrete log of, uh, of Z to the base Y is K, okay? But, uh, you know, and as long as you don't do that, you know, you, you get no information about K. And you can actually information theoretically bound this by something which is negligible, okay? 
And so that's why it really doesn't matter here, and we can use the fact that the simulator might even be computationally unbounded. Okay? And so this is the end of the proof, and I have to stress that it's not easy to you know, go under VGB, so for example, to use I.O. here or something else. So uh, maybe it's not immediately obvious, but we really use kind of inherently some property here of VGB. Okay. So just for the, I want to spend the last five minutes just mentioning the thing about uh, just what you see. Just wrapping up about VGB, I want to say that, of course, there and, and, uh, and AIPO, so there's alternatives to this construction, to uh, Canetti's construction. For example, the construction by we has been conjectured to be AIPO secure, but I just want to point out that one needs to be very careful, first of all, because uh, if you use the plane construction at the beginning, it was already shown in the work of uh, Govasser and Kalai to be insecure for auxiliary input. Uh, it's been extended to work on a, with a family of permutation rather than a single permutation in the work by Bitansky and Panet. And uh, they made some assumption under which it will be AIP, AIP secure. And I just want to stress that even though maybe things are less clear than for Canetti's construction, uh, the, the assumption has suffered in some cases from similar issues like what I just showed. So it's not clear that I wouldn't put my bet there. And so in the paper, we, yeah. So um, it isn't clear that the problem is uh, with the AI VDH. It might very well be with the VGB. It might very well be. And that's exactly, I mean, I should have stressed it more at the beginning, but that's exactly why this type of result, the important message that you get out of here is about the contention and not about the fact that I'm saying it's impossible, okay? So it's impossible under this assumption, but the message you should take home is like, you know, one of the two at most is true. It might well be that VGB is the problem. Okay, so. Or both are false, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the message you should take home is that they're not both true at the same time. Okay, so that's the only thing that we know for sure. Okay, and then you can make your own beliefs out of that, yeah. So, so then it's, but the impossibility of this slide, what does it refer to? The incompatibility of the two? Or? Uh, yeah, I might have overused your impossibility. Yes, incompatibility changed this. Okay, sorry. That's, now I see where you're confused. Yes. Okay. The thing is, you should have like, this joint set of posters if you have incompatible assumptions, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. So and I wanted to just point out that you know, we just, in the paper we have some longer discussion also which other assumptions you know, imply actually AIPO more generically. And uh, I'm not don't have time to discuss this. How about other problems other than AI and PO that Yes, I mean it depends on how general your question is, right? So for other problems you mean so how general is your result? So th th this particular result here is tailored at, uh, at, uh, at, at this particular AIPO. So it can be generalized in a sense that if constructions have certain properties, then you can, uh, sim you can extend it, but it's specific to this security property. So okay. what about UCE? You have a result. Is it related to this? Yeah, so it is related. So I guess UCE, I really, well, I guess the time is running out. But uh, so, uh, so what I want to say for UCE, I mean, let me try to summarize that in the couple of minutes that I have left. So. So one of the key points here is to show a relation between AIPO and UCE. And so what is UCE? I mean, for those of you that are not familiar, so UCE is really an assumption about hash functions. So by itself, it's not directly related to obfuscation. And has been proposed by Bellar et al. To, as a notion to replace random oracles in, in some construction relying on random, relying on random oracle. And uh, uh, so one of the key points about UCE is, is that there won't really be time to uh, discuss the notion too much, but uh, so what you, see, what you see essentially tries to formalize and formalize this is the notion that, you know, in certain contexts, a certain hash function might be indistinguishable from a random oracle. And what it, the way that this is formalized is by having experiments where we have a source that can either access a hash function from a hash family or access a random oracle, and then provide some leakage to a distinguisher that knows the actual hash function sample from the family, and the task of the distinguisher is to distinguish whether the source was interacting with the random oracle uh, or was interacting with the hash function. And uh, the key point here is that, and of course you want to say that a certain family of hash function is UCE secure for a certain source if no distinguisher can tell apart. And the key point is that you can't really achieve, and we know that, uh, UCE security for all possible sources. So for example, if you have a source that just query a certain input and then just gives you the corresponding output and leaks out the input-output pair, therefore a distinguisher is very easy to figure out whether 
uh, you, the, the source was interacting with a hash function or with a random oracle. Okay? And so skipping ahead a, a couple of slides here, there is actually a, there's been like very different classes of sources that have been considered for which people have looked at whether UC is possible or not for a concrete hash function. And uh, in particular, the landscape looked a little bit complicated. And, uh, and uh, so there's, you know, there's been you know, these two classes of sources. These are computational sources that are computational and statistical and predictable sources. So these are sources for which it is exactly hard to, uh, for a predictor to guess which queries the source is making. And there's other classes like splittable sources, and you can also restrict sources with respect to how many queries they make to the, to the actual hash function that has been given. And in particular, S1 will be the, the set of sources that only make one query. And uh, so we have different results showing inachievability. And uh, in particular, it's very easy, that's what I just said before, to see that you can't achieve security for all sources that make only one query. And there's been some work showing by Bruska, Farshin, and Mittelbach that showed that uh, we can't achieve um, UC security for sources for which it is only computationally hard to, um, to predict which queries the source has been doing. And somehow this is, you know, this has kind of like created a game where we try to see, you know, for which sources we can opt to have security and still find meaningful applications. And all the results that we have in this work, um, oh, and I wanted to stress here that all of these impossibility results are really results of the type, you know, showing that, you know, for, for any hash function you can come up with, there exists a source for which you can't achieve UC security. Okay? So, in two things we also show in this work, uh, uh, and these results are assuming I.O., and two things that we show in this work, the first of all is that we can actually uh, find actually other sources for which UC security cannot be achieved that satisfies other properties, including splitability. And I won't have time to discuss this. I only want to point out that this result is actually quite interesting because on the way, we do this by showing the impossibility under I.O. of a certain type of stronger leakage resilient encryption that we can show how to achieve with uh, hash functions that are UC secure for sources that are in the intersection of these classes, but that we can, we can, that we can prove impossible under I.O. But the more interesting fact with respect to AIPO is that if we actually look at UCE for sources that are at the intersection of all of these classes, so we can actually characterize, and that's the key point you have to take home, so a class of sources for UCE security that turns out to be essentially equivalent if AIPO exists to AIPO. Okay? So even though we are actually looking here at security for hash functions in the context of instantiating random oracles, there is a very tight connection between certain types of UC securities that we are still expecting to be possible for now because they are not covered by existing impossibility result and AIPO security. So the two notions are really, are really connected with each other. Okay, and uh, so let me just conclude, since I clearly ran out of time, that uh, I think you know, the main conclusion here is that you know, in this work we really try to explore this landscape and I really only showed a couple of examples of a uh, security notion that somehow rely, uh, have this common denominator of having their security relying on uh, some auxiliary input. And this is an extremely tricky uh, setting to consider. Uh, there are some non-obvious uh, results that exclude like, like this contention results using VGB. But, uh, you know, we really found some interesting connection between UC and IPO. They show that there's some common factor that, you know, that they all share and also reduce kind of the set of things we can look at. And, and really this leads us to the, I think, the challenging open question, which we really don't answer. But it seems that, you know, a very crucial open question is to try to figure out whether AIPO is possible at all. I mean, not only if you're interested in the notion of, uh, in the notion of obfuscation, but also because it's really also relevant uh, in the context of instantiating hash functions uh, for random oracle secure schemes, and uh, you know, it would be a very valuable thing to explore. And we really only give a very you know, partial indication here, which is exactly in this sense of this contention result. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Uh, well, a bit less than what I wanted to say. But thank you very much. Any of the positive uses of no, actually not. So, but I think there was this sense that if you just 
you know, so the, the key point there is that there was this sense that if you just look at the intersection of splittable sources and computational and predictable sources, there was no problem with it. But I think all applications that I'm aware of, they only require also the source to make one query, okay? Which is really the center intersection. And for that, we are still fine. So the only thing that we say additionally that really that, that ends up being equivalent to AIPO, but that's still fine. But it really also tells you that you have to restrict to the number of queries. So you can't have arbitrary number of queries of the sources. But for applications, we, they are fine with just the source having one query. Well, in particular, all the attacks inherently like, you know, require obfuscation, so statistical, statistical and predictable sources. Yeah, this doesn't say anything about statistical and predictable. But there are some applications where you require computational and predictability, and the way we got around impossibility results so far was exactly by you know, getting out of the part that was covered by the impossibility result by assuming splitability. And it so happens that the results are fine. We just want query to the source. And, but if you allow multiple queries, then we have this impossibility. Okay, let's uh, yeah. speaker again.